<laughs> okay. Over there. Uh -huh. Next to that thing? Yep. All right. Now watch. I should have run faster. Damn it, Balotska. It's right here. Let me stomp out some snow here for myself. And we'll start. Hey guys, as you can tell from the title today, we're about to bring back to life some unique car, a Chevrolet Tahoe, which actually used to be the Chevrolet Blazer K5 1994. But what you don't know is its main feature. The main thing is that it's a diesel. And back then, if Americans used to make diesels, they would be insanely huge. This Chevrolet has a 6.5 liter, eight cylinder turbo diesel install. And we couldn't help green to revive this car. That's why when in October 2023, we got a letter from Nikolai saying that it had been a year of him trying to handle this car, we gave up everything we were doing and came to the rest. So here we are in the south of Moscow to deal with one super rare and unique car. Knowing that Oleg would be late, we came on time, and we got ready, and here's a trick. Did you hide the car? We did. We tried our best. And now, here's the question. Oleg doesn't know what car we came here for. He doesn't even know what's wrong with it. He knows nothing. It's a challenge. Let me tell you, we've never done it before. We've never dealt with such cars. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, so the car is somewhere here. So I can see it from here. Yep. Now try to guess. Choose any three. What car can it be? Perhaps the Golf 3? Nice guess. We've also got a Kia, Celtus, a Lancer 10, an Iran Hodger Samand, a Cherry Tigo, a Prado 150, a Ford Explorer, a Touran, a Škoda Octavia, a Chevrolet Tahoe. Is it some big Chevrolet? Also, here's an Opel, a Tiguan, Capture, Haval, Pajero 3, Nissan, a Nissan Qashqai, a Sorento Prime, and even a Logan over there. What do you think? And you can not even just look at this side. Well, my first guess was Chevrolet Tahoe, but I don't think so. Okay. My second guess is that Khodra Samand. Iran Khodra Samand. Because you're talking a lot about it. We haven't worked with it, but maybe it's high time to start. And the third guess, let it be Prado. I see. We've never revived it either. Okay, these three. Why did you choose them? Tahoe just stands out. It's not easy, I know. Also, you keep talking about that Khodra Samand, but it's interesting because what the hell is it even? Yeah. It's the Iranian Peugeot. Yep. And uh, Prado, I don't know. We have never revived such a body. Even though we reviewed the Golf 3 many times. Also revived a Kia Celtis almost every day. And a Lancer 10. Yeah, not interesting. Usually you choose some interesting stuff like tractor, GCB or something. Oh, and I forgot to mention the Jaguar wagon. You did, but we don't have it here, so it doesn't count. A Jaguar wagon. Damn, it's the first time I've seen such a car. Okay, Oleg, let me tell you, out of these three, you actually guessed one. Now, second round of who wants to be an Olegionaire, let's go. So, we'll eliminate them one by one. Yep, which one is definitely not? Out of these three, uh, I think Prado. Eliminating the Prado. Yes. That's right. Now, 50-50 chance on the last two. 50-50. Can I get help from the audience? No, we have no audience. Damn it. We have help, but no audience. Yeah, and we can call a friend, but we don't have friends. No friends either. Well, I think we should leave Kodra Samand and eliminate Taho. And now it's time for the right answer, Oleg. When I first came here, I was happy to see at least two cars which could draw your attention. And they did. Both of them. We actually had a choice between the Iran Khodra Saman and the Chevrolet Tahoe. But no, Oleg, we came here for the Chevrolet Tahoe. <laughs> Oh.
But the most important thing is what's there under the hood. I was shocked when I read the letter. There's a diesel, but not a regular one, but a six liter diesel. Can you believe that? Did it used to be petrol? No, it was manufactured like that. I don't know, I've never seen one like that. But we all know Americans, if they need more power, they just increase the volume. And it doesn't matter what engines we're talking about here. You need more power? Here, have more volume. That's why they have 7.3 liter petrol engines. Even for the blocks, there are drills of different diameters. Yep, like that. It's up to you which one it will be. And here's the owner. What's your name? Nikolai. The owner, Nikolai, will tell us what the problem is with this car. And you're gonna love it. It's something that we spent 17 days on dealing with the Bentley. The gearbox is dead. That's why I'm calling it a challenge. I'm sick and tired of seeing the same emails about reviving the gearboxes after the Bentley. It seems like the whole world has problems with gearboxes. Just reassemble it. Yep. We already know how take to fix out the gearboxes. gearboxes. True. Toya's coming and we'll take it out right here. So, what's the problem? One day, the reverse gear just disappeared. I thought that maybe it could be easily fixed. Maybe it just didn't turn on. I went to the gearbox guys, they fully worked on it. And while I was going there, the car crashed and started using only one gear. I thought it had something to do with the gearbox crashing itself. Okay. They fixed it, put it together. I can already feel Ola going like... <laughs> but service said that there was still a problem with drive, so it still used only one gear. I went to another GM service, thinking that maybe there was something about the electrical part. After half a month, they called me and said that they were tired of it and asked to pick up the car. I'm out. They didn't even charge me for anything, they just wanted me to live. <laughs> That's the first time in modern history. Usually they love to rip off money for that. So it's trying to switch the gears. When you start it, there's a kick. It's trying to switch, but then uses only the first or the second gear. Why are the hooks here on the front crooked? They did their part. What do you mean? When it bumped into something or was pulled. Maybe it's the reason for the gearbox problem. Perhaps. The hooks are crooked, the reverse gears is off. What can it be? Did you tow the pole? One time there was a fire under the hood. Oh, what? Why didn't you mention this in your email? It's some additional information. But the fire was local, around the nozzles. And it put itself out. Yep, <laughs> well, it recovered itself. It healed itself. <laughs> no, I mean, it did involve some tears and suffering from some service centers. <laughs> oh, and by the way, Oleg, you didn't hear this, but when we turned off the camera, the owner said that it's not a Chevrolet Tahoe, but a Chevrolet Blazer K5. Like Kia. Yeah, but it's a Chevrolet Blazer K5. And that changes everything. At least he thinks so. <laughs> Until this day, did you know that such a car even existed? I knew about Blazers. And the K5? Nah, I know nothing about them. And what even is a K5? It was an easter egg for Kia. <laughs> yeah, back then. It's a 1996? 94. 94. So now it's crashed? It doesn't reverse? It does because they fixed it, and it drives forward 40 km per hour. But do we even need more? Nah, it has two gears and it's enough. Low and overdrive. Does it have a low one? Cool. Well, I guess we should start it and get under the hood. Or actually, wait a second. Maybe we'll find gear box there. Let's make it... Damn, look at how many radiators are in there. And what about these lovely nostrils? Useless, by the way. We can't do without them. It's fake. <laughs> For real? I didn't get it, I swear. Damn! What's this? It's diesel. <laughs> With a clutch? Or maybe it's a compressor? It's AC. It's the AC compressor? <laughs> Looks weird. You don't say. <laughs> to be honest, the wiring reminds me of Jiguli. <laughs> and look at these two washers tightened with a string. Does the AC work? It's a Mercedes lock, you know. 
No, it's an Audi. Half a lock. Compare it with the compressor. Look how small the generator is. Is it a dropper they installed trying to revive it? Yeah, what the hell is that? This transparent tube. Oh, it's for the pressure sensor. And how much horsepower is there? 800? 180. 100? It's an old diesel. What are you talking about? Six liters. If there were 50 horsepower, I wouldn't be surprised. And the torque's about 600? Yep. And what's up with the wiring over there? Well, like... According to the service, this engine of that year should have electronically controlled high-pressure fuel pump. But something went wrong, and it's mechanical, and it's an old version of the engine. That's why Gearbox guy said that they couldn't recover the standard transmission control system and the way it used to work, because it should have received some data from HPFP. Mm -hmm. Oleg, get your soldering iron. We'll need it here, working with mechanical HPFP and hydromechanical automatic transmissions in general. Are you thinking of soldering HPFP? Yep. It might sound funny, but it's a challenge indeed, because I have no idea what we're doing here. While crashing, it used to have a problem which was solved by replacement of the speed sensor in the gearbox. But that time the speedometer didn't work either. I think it's connected. But has it ever functioned as it should, with no problems with mechanical HPFP? It sure did in 1994. So it's the only breakdown, right? Nothing else has ever been replaced. Nobody got into the gearbox before. It crashed on itself. It's a turbo diesel? I thought it was naturally aspirated. Mm -hmm. And moreover, this turbine spins with the exhaust gases from only one head, but not from the other. The second exhaust exits directly. Was it manufactured that way? Who knows, I think yes. <laughs> there are some extra jacks, the blue ones. Oh, like, don't worry about it. It's Xenon. Is it uh, Xenon engine's light? Sure. Well, shall we start it? Is the gearbox controlled by some particular block or the same one for the engine? Same one. When did you pick up this car? A year ago, almost two years ago. Not so long ago. But it spent more time on services because I bought it with a dead engine. It was smoking, you couldn't come closer than 30 meters. I spent half a year looking for someone willing to work on it, because when you go to the club service with diesel, they tell you to live. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's why they're dealing with GM and they have almost no diesels at all. Then we spent half a year fixing the engine. They changed the turbine, both heads. Typical maintenance. Yep. Then it worked for some time, and after some month the gearbox died. The question. What's next? What's gonna die next? And what's this? It's lights, Oleg. No, I mean this thing. Many lights have such things. But why? Do you think he knows the answer? Why not? Balatska, what's this? I think I wasn't born yet when these ones were made. <laughs> oh, it's for aerodynamics, so the air can go... I think it's when you take off the lights, you can place it on the table. And not scratch it. Without scratching it. I saw some glass lights with it, but I don't know what it's for. Okay, let's start it and see what it even looks like. There's no OBD, I think. There is. There is? But it's not a typical one. Well, it's not OBD then. It does sound like a tractor. I think this engine shouldn't work like this. I don't know about this particular one, but for a V8 diesel, it should be really well balanced. It seems like the combustion chamber isn't working properly. Does it always work like this? Um, it began to work like that after we touched the valve cover and perhaps we didn't put the startup very hematically over the old gasket. It doesn't make a difference. There's no mass airflow sensor or anything. Maybe it sucks too much air. But there's no throttle back. You could easily take it all off. It doesn't care. It's a diesel. But it used to work better until we got into it. If it was vice versa and it wasn't inflating the turbines, then we could say that it's not sealed. But a diesel doesn't care about it while it's idling. Even if you take off the collector, it'll still start and work. And this problem appeared before or after the gearbox died? Before. Before? Can it be the consequence of it? When being so unbalanced, has the gearbox ever worked as it should? Well, it happened kind of at the same time. 
Can this gearbox here have a control block? Is it that kind of gearbox? Oleg, forget about can, forget about K-Line, forget about all of it. Doesn't matter. Everything is half mechanical and straight. Have you tried reading the errors? Yeah. And so what? They found some error in the gearbox saying that there was no connection. No connection with the gearbox? Yes, but I can be sure that this error wasn't there before due to HPFP and many things not being connected. Is this a subwoofer? It's a gift from the previous owner. Tell them that if you have such a wire sticking out, then you shouldn't have this wire sticking in. Okay, Oleg, now you watch the trembler. Mm -hmm. And you'll go check the spark plugs, right? Sure thing. We gotta look for misfires. Why is it so loud? It should be that way. It is so unbalanced. Do you know how to check incorrect firing if we're talking about an old diesel? It's pretty simple. Take your finger, put it over this tube, you feel it here and there. And at the moment, when diesel is pumped under super high pressure, you can easily feel it with your finger. Old diesels have a particular feature. In order for them to stop working, you just need to get rid of the fuel. And that's it. Compression and fuel, and it'll work. When we were fixing the Kickstarter, we broke some metal tube, and we temporarily replaced it with a high-pressure rubber hose. So maybe now it's not well balanced due to it. Rubber. It's a bit thicker. It could easily be so. Rubber tubes are way better than metal ones. Next time you'd better place the one like this from a dropper. It's perfect. How could you even think about a rubber? We couldn't find any better. What are you saying? There are a bunch of them for any type of car. You just bend it as you need and attach it. It should be custom made because they are different from both sides. So any tube from a usual car won't do. Sure thing. Moreover, I'm pretty sure they're all different. The question is, where is this tube placed? Over there. For real? <laughs> Insane. I wonder why the engine is knocking. I don't feel any injection right here or right there either. No injection here or there. But there's an injection in the rubber tube for sure. To be honest, I don't know if that rubber tube will work here at all. So it just happened right after? No, it used to work with it still. Crankcase gases are crazy. Just like a MERS 123. It's knocking so badly, so badly, damn. The oil's leaking everywhere. And another question, was the engine overhaul? It was not. They changed the heads. Heads? He disassembled the engine, measured the fuel combustion chambers and said that it would work for some more time. But before we got into the engine, it had worked even worse. There was no problem with the gearbox. The engine was knocking, smoking, so comparing to what it used to be, now it's working pretty good. Mm -hmm. But there was no problem with the gearbox. This looks like a pressure sensor. Why is it not connected? Is it trying to switch the gears? One time. First time it's trying. But how can you tell? It's like a kick. But the gear remains the same. It crashed a couple of times, but you can fix it by turning it off and starting again. It used to have such a problem even before touching the engine. Is it an anti-freeze drain? No, it looks like a temperature sensor. You can't press it. It's a clamp. You put a main one on such things. Ah, I've never seen it before. Another question. Whose underwear is underneath the windshield washer tank? <laughs> Those are just rags. <laughs> nope, that's underwear. Literally underwear. So, where's your launch, which can be connected to anything? But who knows if we can connect it to this car? What's the diagnostic connector here? I think you can connect it even to a wooden cut. 
Where is the diagnostic connector here? I have no idea, actually. The guys in the service said they were trying to plug in somewhere here. But where? Oh, right here. I see it. But it's an old GM connector. And you know where you can find it, Oleg? I don't. Where? Avtovaz has it. It's an old Vaz connector. Because Avtovaz, back in the days, was manufactured at the old GM block. I mean, the first Avtovaz injectors. Are we going to play football? After we're done with that. Have you tried using an appropriate wire? No, we've discovered it recently. What'd you discover? The mass on this wire is uh, shitty. These minus wires to the engine is flaccid down there. We can't reach it properly. I wanted to change it, but I didn't know where it was coming from. But when I disassembled the glove compartment, I realized that it goes somewhere to the brain. Now it may turn out that there was no proper minus. One day, Oleg, we won't hear this word anymore. Brain. But it won't be today. When I realized that this old Chevrolet has an old GM connector, I was over the moon because in my launch set of adapters, I got the right connector. But it was not all rosy, and the launch is not that omnipotent after all. And it turned out that it can't read this particular car. We tried so many ways to connect the launch to it, but we couldn't find anyone. Communication problem. Communication problem. All right. Does anyone know where the control unit is? Inside? I think it's in the glow compartment. Oh, sure. You need to open it, disassemble this shit, and it's somewhere inside. But we have no tools! I guess we'll have to rip it out with a cable. We have a bet here. A bet? Yeah. So? The owner is trying to convince me that his Chevrolet uses how much? 15 to 20 liters. Of diesel? Why are you surprised? It should be 30. No way. Diesels are way more economical, even old ones. I think it might use even less. It wouldn't surprise me. Who's betting on what? I thought 30 at least. What are you talking about? Not every truck uses that much. 30 liters. They don't use as much as you think they do. That's the thing about diesel. They used to be weak and not use much fuel, and now they're strong and still don't use much diesel. They're always like that. Even the ones like this even with six liters? Even 25 liters. No problem. Okay, my bad. I even cheated on it a bit. Balotska, don't jump to conclusions. Electronics! Wow! Damn! It even goes to the heater! Oh wait, the heater's electric! The servo mechanism! Get this, Bolotska! Let me do this, you don't know how! Let's do this cool transition! There you go! Take it! We have to leave the sound! What do we have here? I think it's that control unit. The very one that we're desperately and hopelessly trying to connect to. I think you can insert a video cassette there. <laughs> Stick a videotape in. Look, here's an extra wire. Like a hella relay, which this white wire is attached to. And it leads here, but not to the unit. It's important. So they cut something off the unit. Oleg, mm -hmm. I found some electronics here. No way. <laughs> Real old. With the lights? Yeah. So here I see a cut-off wire, but I'm sure it was cut off a long time ago, so we have no worries about it. What do you want to find here? Tell me what. I'm always asking myself this question. Bolotsky, you tell me, what do I want to find here? A green arrow pointing towards the fault. <laughs> you have reached your goal. What is this unit even? Why is it only half connected? What the hell is it? There is a small unit near the control one. After going through the engine due to the crashing, they changed the speed sensor in this tiny unit and it actually helped. We don't know what exactly, but either of those. Did they change it? They tried one from another car, but nobody knows where they ended up installing. It's either original or from another car. As I understood, it's connected to the speed sensor somehow. 
There's a jack missing in here. I wonder if it's supposed to be like that, but I don't think so, because there used to be another jack connected, but now it's gone. They thought this car doesn't need it anymore. Has anyone ever got inside the unit to see what's up? Hmm. They tried another unit when the gearbox crashed. They tried another unit, it didn't help, so they put the original one back. Uh-huh. The best way to check anything. Oleg, they tried another unit, so we have nothing to do with it. No, it was the last time. When they were fixing the engine, the gearbox crashed too, but not this time. So, they didn't try another unit this time. I see, wow. It's working, why so fast? Are you a real diagnostician? <laughs> nope. But Oleg is. It looks just like in a plane. No, he needs to call a flight attendant. There's so much stuff. What's this? It's for opening the garage. Damn! <laughs> I'm not touching anything. But it's so interesting. What's this? It's for glasses? Damn. Oleg, do you want a car like this? Not so much. Why, look, it's like a tank. Wait, is this a fridge between the seats? It's a minibar. A what? Oh, I got it. Let's see what's on the menu. Fuses. Poxipol. A true minibar. You've got quite a space there. Polotska, shush. Those cameramen, paparazzi. Following us, making us take pictures or even record videos. We can switch to contacts and... Uh... And burn the car down. No. It should help. For you to understand how a good old diagnostic method works, you switch two pins that you know for sure, and at that moment an engine light indicator starts blinking on the dashboard, for example. And according to the number of blinks, you understand the fault code. Then you look at the table and figure out what this code stands for. And that's how you realize what type of error occurs in the control unit. This Chevrolet is no exception, so let's take a wire, switch the contacts on the connector, and pay attention to the blinking. Turn it on. So. Service throttle soon. Nothing's blinking. Oleg, are you sure you switched the right things? Oh, wait, I think it's because the launch was plugged in. I get it. It uh, may be the thing, and there's actually no errors at all. Then we need to start it, drive it a bit, and then try again. And having no errors is not surprising at all, Oleg. Where would they come from if you took off the clamps, for example? It's an old car. It won't remember anything. Let's try it out to see if it's even going to move or if it's not. And look at this lever. Yeah. It's actually scary. Damn, it doesn't even show what gear it's in right now. It's only a three-speed gearbox? Maybe uh, that is the reason. What reason? So it doesn't know what gear it is. Out of three? PR... You said the indicator doesn't work. Yeah, but it's a mechanical indicator, which just shows you here. I'm sure the gearbox knows what's up. It's a low gear. Why is it so fast? I would have expected it to be a lot slower. Yeah, it's definitely a low gear. Now here's the second one, isn't it? It is. Here's the second. Damn, how do we turn? It's the second one or not? I think it was. What about the reverse? There, there it is. We're moving. Now it doesn't switch. <laughs> sure, so the first time it kind of worked, but uh, now it doesn't switch. Damn, it's really scaring me every time it's changing gears. Let me reverse and try it again. It's good that we're using low, because I don't think we'd be able to gain speed using drive. Damn it, Oleg! You're so far away, it's like you're in a different car. Mm -hmm. uh, we can easily fit another person here. The full-sized one, I'd say. Wow. 
No, it switched. It did. But I think it will crash right afterwards. Like it shifts and then goes into limp mode. So it switches but doesn't stay in the first gear. Yeah, it's an emergency gear, which is more likely the second one here. I have a strange idea. Very strange. Should we try turning off the unit completely? Let's see how it'll behave without this control unit. Will it start? Will it move? It has to have an emergency mode. Let's try. Let's do it. Just take off the unit, like right out of the jack. Can you do it? I'll do my best. <laughs> That's a universal wrench. What? Sure. There we go. Mm -hmm. Let's see what's about to happen. First of all, nothing's lit up. No check or anything. But this diesel still starts. Without the control unit. Pure magic. Let's take a ride. Let's go. But it'll behave the same way. Well, maybe, but actually it should crash right away. In emergency mode, there should be no gears at all but only one. It moves so fast, though, even in reverse. Is there the second reverse? Sure, let me switch to the overdrive and that'll be the second reverse. It'll be fun if it behaves the same. Yep, and real interesting, too. No, he uses the second gear right away. Yep, in second, and in emergency mode. So this unit does in fact control something. It's so fun. Balatska. What? Do you want a car like this? No way. It's too big. You love all that bling bling. Yeah. We could run right over your pointer. I know. And we won't even notice it. We'll wind it on the gimbal. Uh, Turn the key in the ignition to the position 1 without the engine running. In such a case, check engine should let up 12 three times in a row. So now something is up with the diagnostic itself. We don't have a check engine light. Maybe that's the problem. Isn't this one check engine? No. Maybe it should exist, but it's just not there. Well, in the end, we ended up driving back and forth a couple of times, the gearbox crashed, we rewire it, nothing happened. There was nothing blinking on the dashboard. And that means that we maybe have a totally different problem. Maybe we don't have the thing that was supposed to blink. I think we need to analyze the dashboard in order to see whether there's a check engine. You think there's no light bulb? What's with the brake pedal? Why is the brake pedal kicking while I'm starting it? Is the power steering hydraulic and not vacuum? That's the reason. As I said, it may be connected. Before it used to switch not like it should on the run, but it switched when you don't touch the brakes. So you release the brakes and it switched. Yeah? So on the low, it switched not prop, but on the overdrive, you could do it only by not touching the gas pedal. I think we should try reaching the light bulb. You do that, and I'll go check the scheme. Consisting of three wires, Oleg. Fine, I'll figure out what it leads to, if I'm lucky. And then we can plug in the control unit there. Okay. So. Let's go deep inside this fantastic car. Let me explain. The car definitely switched to emergency mode. We tried it a couple of times and now we're sure of it. If it switches to emergency mode, it should have a reason for that. If it has the reason and self-diagnostics, then it should explain that reason to us. That's why we're trying to make the standard diagnostic system work. There's no check engine light, and it should definitely work in the case of self-diagnostics. We think that perhaps this light bulb is burnt out. So I'm getting into the dashboard to replace the light bulb with another one. And look to see if it's plugged in or not. Damn. Look, there were some wires burning. What's the name of the owner? We, I don't think we introduced each other. We did. I asked. He even told us his name. Vadim, I guess. 
What's your name? Nikolai. Why Vadim? No reason. Thanks. So anyone that you don't know is Vadim? Look, I'm twisting a screwdriver without a handle even. Look, all the screws were completely destroyed a long time ago. It's holding on by a thread. I would never drive over bumps at high speed in a car that goes like bang, 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 bang. Why are we getting into this? Because every time we start the car up and switch the contacts on the dashboard, there's a sign, service throttle soon. It's just lit. Oleg found some information that if we switch to the diagnostic mode, this bulb should blink code 12, which means that there's no faults, or show the exact faults. But in our case, the bulb stays lit, so we may say that it's the wrong bulb. Damn it, there's a mechanical speedometer, so we should unscrew the speedometer cable. Isn't oil pressure mechanical? <laughs> just like the 123 has. Oh my god, don't you tell me that I can just... Oh wait, the speedometer is electronic. Yeah, and there's already some electrical tape. <laughs> the service engine soon light looks like this, so like... Yep, it's missing. Sir and G, look what's written. So, because they're mechanical odometer numbers, we need to move them manually. And here's an electric motor, which snaps, which snaps from time to time and changes the mileage. So we can't change it. Very easily. Just connect the motor and switch it to whatever you like. Of course, just like we expected, this Chevrolet Blazer didn't even have a check engine light. It sure would love to blink, but had nothing to do it with. Because we don't have such bulbs on us, we take a working one from another place and install it into check and put it back together. What should we sacrifice? You want to replace it. Yep, yeah, because it definitely works. Let's go ahead and take it off carefully. Something's lit. Oh, oh. It's service engine soon. But it's not blinking. Not blinking yet. Oh, and there it goes. It's blinking. Oh, like you see? One, two, three. Waiting. One. One, two, three. Uh, Thirteen. One and three. One and three. One, two, three. It's working, Oleg! Diagnostics are working! So, 13 it is. 12 is empty, and 13 is full. Full of shit? Yup. Oxygen sensor. Wow. Oxygen sensor? It's weird. What are you talking about? For what engine is this? For a petrol one. We don't have it here. It doesn't even know that code. It's not even for the right motor. You chose the wrong engine. I see you, but it's hard to find the right one. All right, well, look. Then we spent 30 or 40 minutes just counting the blinking lights. For you to understand how this car works, it blinks three times for each check. Three times! And all the checks are ranked from the smallest to the biggest. There are about 95 possible faults. And the most interesting thing is that the ones that we need are at the very end, 70, 80, and 90. And because the car is rather old, there are a lot of faults. So we got tired of watching it blink first for code 13, then 15, then 25, then 27, then 35, and so on and so on. And finally, after about 40 minutes, we reached 80, and we were able to see the one we were waiting for. 57. 57. BCM, 5 volt, closed. Oh, Oleg, this is for you. 85. Transmission gear error. That's what we were waiting for, Oleg. Damn! I don't want to go back to the past. They say it used to be way better. Sure! You just spent 20 minutes trying to read the faults! It's crazy! I don't want to go back to the past. Finally, we've read all the faults! How much time did it take us? 40 freaking minutes! Well, I can finally stop the car. We found the most... Oh! Oleg, look! The Prado's leaving. We didn't have to revive it. We were just hanging out next to it, and it came back to life. 
So you think that this gear ratio era is exactly what? Exactly what we need. So it expects to see one speed in the output shaft, but it gets another one. Yeah, the speed ratio. I wouldn't talk about mechanical faults at this point. I would only discuss electronic or electrical faults. But not about chain termination. More like an incorrect signal from the sensors, or the unit doesn't see the sensor signal, or something else like that. So we can't look at the speeds of the input and output shaft in any way through the measured values. But connecting an oscilloscope directly to the unit, we'll be able to see those indicators. If we'll be able to find them. Balatska, aren't you bothered by Oleg's behavior? He's clowning around. He sure is. I'm mocking you. He's turned into some kind of a horrible person. You don't like my ideas. What's your idea? To go back and forth a thousand times? Okay, let's do it. Get away. I'll do it so that Oleg can finally calm down. Where? Where are we going, Oleg? Nowhere. I'd like to hear your idea. Nope, you said we should drive, so we will. Let's go. Close the door. Let's go. Reverse gear? There we go. Going forward? Say no more. Anywhere you say. We could go off-road if you want to. No. All right. I'm switching to first gear. That's what you want? Go for it. Okay, that's as far as we can go. That took a lot of time. Did you feel it? A lot. All in all, it was bad. Okay, now I'm not pushing anything. We're just driving. No, you should, so we can reach 20, 2500. To 2500? Okay. There it is. Wow. And that's first gear. And why so? The emergency mode. You're so surprised, as though I were saying that it was impossible. Great. And what do we have? That it happens not when we're trying to switch gears, right? Amazing. But it still means that there could be problems with the indicators of input and output shaft. What's changed? Yet yeah, didn't happen when switching gears, but what's changed? The question is not about how fast the packets are being compressed, it's... Uh... I've been saying it the whole time! I told you right away! Don't even think about it, there's no problem for sure! So the problem starts at the first gear, and for some reason it doesn't happen at the reverse. Yep. Because it doesn't have to switch gears, there's no need to control the speed for reverse. So it doesn't bother it. Yep. So it does There's nothing to be bothered. It's just a unit and a box. There are no eyes. I'll be even worse than you, so that you can feel it yourself! Even though right away we saw in the control unit the faults 85 and 86 that we needed about the incorrect ratio of input and output shaft speeds, we decided to start with a bit more obvious fault, the 5 volt fault, because we also had that in the unit. And what if the power is not supplied to the sensors, so there's no signal from them, and that's why the speed ratio is off. So we need to take off the unit and go deeper. Let's take it off. You know, Oleg, I've been waiting for the moment when we'd be taking off and disassembling the control unit in this Chevrolet. Properly disassembled? Of course. How else are you going to solder 5 volts here? Why should we solder? We should. What else can we do? They tried a unit from another car, and it was fine. Oleg, you're not listening at all. They tried it even before the major overhaul, and there was no such problem. They were looking for another problem. Which one were they looking for? It was crashing. But it turned out that there was a problem with the output sensor. One of the sensors, either distributor speed sensor or this one. You see, they tried it way before this fall. Well, like you're being so inattentive. So they didn't try another unit in order to fix this fault. Anyway, we should look for the pinout, or you suggest random plugging in everywhere. I suggest opening the unit and looking at the burnt capacitor or some other 5 volt nonsense. This is ancient, Oleg. You can see everything in there without glasses or a microscope. Can you please bend this thing and I'll pull out the connector? We figured out that we always have to get into the unit, always. If Oleg is with us reviving cars, we must get into the unit. Any unit, even if it's made out of cement, we're still gonna get into it. Is it okay to have some oil in your unit? Oleg, can you please check the oil level in the unit? Is there a lot of it? Enough to check it. And it's just as it should be. Oleg, don't watch. Otherwise, you'll find something. And then what? But I won't. Why so? Would I notice something? I'm not trying to poke other people's eyes. 
Oh, I can see some rusty pins here and there, but it's not the root of the problem for sure. There are even some dead spiders, but they're also not a problem. But there must be some problem here inside this unit. Also, it's kind of wet. It's covered in polish, so it wasn't wet everywhere. Oleg's like a wise lion sitting and waiting for me to play around with this thing. Then he'll just take it and say what the problem is right away. Yeah, they were definitely trying to solder something. Let me give you some light here. It's fine. Thanks. Blinding me a bit, but still fine. Now we're moving on to the most interesting part of the video. Oleg plus unit equals love. But actually, Oleg plus unit equals three hours wasted. It turns out that this unit is not as simple as it seemed. There's a bunch of layers. Nevertheless, we found a lot of oxidized things. Then we found some things that they tried to repair and soldered up. And we still have a 5 volt fault. So now Oleg will clean the unit, make it look nice and good, soldering the contact, which was almost ruined by somebody else. And after that, we connect it, disassembled as it is, to the car. And first of all, we try to drive, and if nothing changes, then we check all the five volts in the unit, and there are three of them, right? We can check them right away. I agree. So there are two ways. Either because of the oxide, something is bridging and it shouldn't, or vice versa. There's no five volts. And we need to figure out exactly which ones and whether there's any circuit. Okay, Oleg, let's deal with it and go straight to California to ride around in this fantastic car. Actually, I don't think that the unit's the problem. Oleg, no, please. I know what's up. Have a look at the wheels. Predator M.T. These are the wheels for the manual gearbox. No, M.T. stands for mud terrain. No, it's manual transmission. No, it's mud terrain. There's also A.T., M.T., and so on. A.T., M.T., lots of them. Oh, look, Oleg's spraying it with a perfume because the unit doesn't smell good. Well, not the unit, but Oleg. Just kidding. Come on, my jokes are just as bad as yours are. Let me tell you a joke. One day, Isa came back from school with a note from the teacher. Watch Isa. He stinks. And his parents read a note back to the teacher. You should not smell Isa, but teach him. We have one person who's laughing at your joke. That's an achievement. Yeah? Who? The owner's friend. Oh, that's amazing. So it was an invasion. I'm pretty sure some of our viewers will also find it funny. They're also the owner's friends. Do you actually believe that it can be the reason? Well, we believe that it could partially be the reason. But in order to check it out properly and see whether there are five volts, it should be totally clean with no bridges. But if that turns out to be the reason, it'll be great. And actually, it may be the reason. Because oxidation could transfer anything to adjacent contacts. Literally anything. You know, I always wonder where you put all the extra stuff that you cut off. I'm just throwing it away. I thought you were just collecting them at home. For what? Might come in handy. Nah. Nah, I used to collect them for the first 15 years, but they never did come in handy, so I gave up. And how many 15 years have you had since then? I wasn't counting. I used to, but got tired of it, so now I'm not doing that either. So we just plug it in, drive, and everything starts working right away. And then we come up with a theory and just leave, right? What theory are we talking about? The wires just got shorter. So they just bridged and shorted? Just bridged and shorted? It's so cold inside these Chevrolets. Sit down. Oh, you think that's it? Okay, let's drive this Chevrolet. Merci. Look at the bulb. First turned off, but now it's blinking again. God knows what's happening. Let's just drive into the wall. Today we're the NCIP. Check on the safety. Let's go. I think it's all the same. 
Troy once again. I think it switched more smoothly. It certainly did. And the revs were different too. It used to be way higher and now it's just 1500. I think it's about to switch again. Let's see. Come on. Nope. Now it's time to check the 5 volts. Mm, damn. So, here goes nothing. Now we're going to check the 5 volts. Two cheeseburgers and french fries, please. Anything to drink? Still water. Proceed to the cashier. <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> You're funny, Bolatska. I'm not turning it off. Let's see as it is. Here's five volts. As it should be. In this spot. But let's check some other places. Here's two. Here's two. Exactly five volts. All three of them and this one indeed was a five volt. There we have it. Let me turn the car off and check all those faults all over again. There's nothing else to do. Waiting. We need number 57. Okay, it was 13 just now. Damn it, it's crazy, but soldering indeed helped. There used to be fault 57 in 5 volts, and now it's gone. And we still have the gear ratio faults from inside the transmission, but that's fine, we had to fix the 5 volt fault, and I think it disappeared because of these oxides. And now we don't have much to do. We have an electrical schematic, and according to that, we find the output signal sensor from the gearbox, check it with the scope, and figure out if the signal is coming to the unit. And if it isn't, then there's a problem with the wiring or the indicator. The moment we've all been waiting for. Oscilloscope time. To get a good shot, I'll have to hold it like this. Where's the lighter? I don't know. Wow. That'll do, I guess. Here's something. But we're not moving. Oh. Oh, wait, wait. We are. We're going. There it is. Input shaft. Oh, input shaft. Look, look. I'm switching to drive, but nothing changes. And what if we go faster? Yeah, that's it. We can see everything now. Now we need to find the output. We do. We're moving. No, we're not. So, we have a problem with incorrect sensor ratios, and at the same time signals are coming from both sensors. Wow. That's pretty weird, because everything is very tight in the gearbox. And so how can you have an incorrect ratio if all the signals are there? And also no transmission slipping. There might be a fault in the program of the transmission when it's slipping. It's transmission slipping, so if it slips frictionally, there's a particular fault for that. But it's not lit. So it says that there's no transmission slipping, but the ratio is off. It's so strange. It means one more wire and one more needle. Let's try to visually see this ratio. Should we compare them? What'll it give us? Perhaps if we record the moment of its switching, we can find something more. Okay, let's do it and see if anything changes. It's an easy test, so let's go. Here we go. And we can even see the kick. We can even see the kick. So everything was increasing gradually and then boom. Here's also 360. 
So it means that we start moving, we get the kick, and after that, the gear ratio doesn't change. So the gear doesn't change, actually, and nothing is bridging. And uh, what about this emergency mode that we have? It's like a constant first gear. What if we actually didn't start with the first one? But the ratio is the same. Both for reverse and drive. For drive after the kick. True, the ratio is always the same. We need to think it through. So the first day of reviving has come to an end. It got dark, so there was no way we could do anything in the dark there. But in the end, we found out something interesting. It turned out that for some reason, the ratio in the gearbox never changes in this car. It's no matter whether you're driving until the fault or afterwards, or even if you switch to reverse. The gear ratio does not change, and it's pretty weird. Now we understand why the control unit claims the gear ratio error. It means that we must go on, but on the next day, and at the shop. So, the day has come. The car is outside, so first we have to move it in here, lift it up, and see how the gearbox is organized, whether it's all inside or outside. If we can look inside, pull out some sensors. I don't have any ideas yet which way we should go, but it's clear that the gearbox is sabotaging itself because it doesn't like the gear ratio inside that old control unit, the primitive Pentium 05. So it seems like the gear ratio is off. So, let's bring the car inside, take a look, figure it out. Act first, think later. Oleg, why the heck did we decide to revive the gearbox? Haven't we had enough dead engines? Look at that happy Tolia over there, hoping to get down to business, but not yet. Why the heck, we agreed to only revive engines. Mm. Only the dead ones. But this one starts and drives, no problem. So it's all done and fixed then. Sure, let's give it back. Tolia, watch out, don't let me run anyone over. Do you hear the sounds the engine's making? Each of those sounds, it shakes the car. Bang, 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 and it keeps pace. It's a kind of vibro massage. Look at this thing. Just fantastic. I told you this before, it looks way better than it drives. Here's a whole bunch of people who love to say it was better back in the day. And they're all like, oh, these stupid... Engineers! You know, the engineers don't do anything, it's just the marketers. Why do those marketers even do anything? 30 years ago, there was a great engine invented, so just keep using it! So I think all the people like this must be put into cars like this, V8, six and a half liters, a huge engine that uses 20 liters every 100 kilometers, it gives you 600 newton meters of torque and 180 horses. So technology is evolving so fast that old cars just can't. It's like I'm saying that my dad has a friend who back in 2000 got a computer, Pentium 4, super fast, 2.4 gigahertz, so he could give it to his kids later. He said, I'll take the best one now so I can pass it on to my kids. Already then. And I was just 12. I just facepalm. It was so obvious to me that this Pentium 4, 2.4 gigahertz, would be super old in just two years. So it did. Later some dual cores and other stuff appeared. And that's it. Obviously. I mean that the gearbox is a black box which turns limited sources into nothing. So, 
Because we kind of have no idea what to do. Oleg, do you? We need to ask Tola to lift it up and look at it from the bottom as if we know what's up. That's right. So, since we don't have, well, usually when we're reviving a car, we have some kind of a plan. So we know what to do in advance. But now we have no plan at all. So we're going with the flow. We need to fix this car. And in order to do so, we need to get as much information as possible. So let's lift it up and have a look from the bottom. Maybe we'll know is something, and we'll base our theories on it and continue to prove them right or wrong. Just small lighters on last Google. Less Google sounds a little self-deprecating, Oleg. We just need like three or four weeks and that's we, it. We'll finally figure out the way it works. We have to finish the reviving tonight. We've got three hours. Let's go. I'm gonna Google stuff. Look at these wonderful rims. You've got this small of a rim and this big of a tire. Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. And the brake pad. My Octavia's rear brake pad is bigger than this one. And it doesn't matter that the Octavia is two times lighter. Well, but there are people who love cars like this, and they have all the rights to enjoy a ride. There are also people who love Volga 21, who restore it perfectly and enjoy Sunday ride, but doesn't mean that they drive it every day. But from time to time you do enjoy such a ride, but of course it's ridiculous to use it every day. It's totally insane. Damn, yeah, Tolia, I'm scared. I'm not going under this car. I'll be watching from here. Moreover, it's a coupe. A coupe, Oleg, does not look like that. It's a three-door SUV. Everything that has two side doors is a coupe. No. Oleg, what's a coupe? It's a type of a train carriage. And there's only one door there. What's so particular about a coupe? You really don't know why some cars are called coupes and some are not? No. Are you being serious? I was never interested. Have you ever heard of a case compartment? No. What's its feature? Why is it different to any other wardrobe? It has sliding doors. That's what I'm talking about. In a train compartment, you also have them. You have them in your coupe. So a car which you can call a coupe has no windscreen frame and glass sliding down into the door. So if it doesn't have those, it's not a coupe then. And if the rear glass can also do that, it's called a coupe hardtop. So if there are four doors but with no frames, it's still a coupe? Yep, it's a coupe with four doors. Our cameraman, Lyosha, has a Passat CC. And CC aren't just random letters, it's comfort, comfort coupe. Comfort coupe, that's what it's called. There are four door coupes, two door coupes, and it is a coupe. Got it? For example, look, look at that Passat B7. We can go up to it, open the trunk, and there's a sticker with info about its configuration. And there will also be written Passat B7 Lim. Lim stands for limousine. I don't know why, but when I was working for Volkswagen, all of the sedans were marked limousine. I have no idea why. Have a look here. Look, here's a sticker. You can also find it in the service book, but it's easier to find here. Look, and it says Passat Lim. See? Maybe it stands for limited edition. No, 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 it's a limousine. Because when you go and register it in Elsa, it'll be signed up as limousine. Damn, it's scary. There's a hole here in the muffler. And, and what? Is that your only concern, Oleg? That's why it's not working. All right, I'm just... I'm all for safety here. I don't think it'll lean backwards. I think... I'm just gonna stand. <laughs> Jeez, this starter's as big as the engine of a Polo. Polotska, your, your, your pointer's engine is smaller than this starter. Look at that, a seal. A seal in the gearbox? Yeah, the gearbox was repaired. And we'll ignore that it's leaking? I see red oil. Here is the overheating indicator. It didn't overheat. For real? Oh, I think they attached it themselves. After the repairing, they just welded it, I think. And it's totally fine for a connector to almost... For a wire and connector to lay on the drive shaft. Jeez, if that turns out to be the root of the problem, I'll be damned. 
And here are some balancing weights, and the wire is here right on top of the drive shaft, laying right on top of it. It's not above the drive shaft, but right on top of it. And don't even get me started about wiring. It's attached to the gear tubes with clamps. And also, is it okay to have a connector that's not connected? It's not fully connected. It's not connected at all. And where does it lead to? I think to the gearbox. It goes up somewhere. It's getting more and more interesting. Oh, look, a clamp right on the drive shaft. To hell with the clamp. We've got wires on it, too. It's madness. Just madness. Are they damaged? We'll see. Let's take off the connector and have a look. Yep, they're a bit damaged. Is there any circuit? No, maybe just a bit. They didn't drive this car enough for it to happen. But this, Balatska, come here and get a shot of it. <laughs> so this rubber should be inside. Sure thing. Look, it's not even snapped at all. I guess they didn't have enough clams. I suggest that we start our lovely diagnostic process with two things. First, we take off this connector from the gearbox and see how badly it's all damaged. And then we'll deal with that connector. And then we'll drive. Yeah, and everything will be totally fine. Oh, look, it wasn't even properly snapped. But it's all covered with sheet and oil, though. All of it. Hey, I think you've got to change your oil there. There had to be the sensors and also solenoids because it goes inside the gearbox. Let's see if anything else is damaged here. Oh, and look how nicely everything is shielded in there. This rubber is oozing oil. Hey, maybe the signals are duplicated from one sensor to another through the oil. Let me unwrap it. I don't know what we can apply yet, because we need to get rid of it first. I'll do it the old-fashioned way, by hand. Disgusting, isn't it? Absolutely disgusting. Look how lovely this oil is. It's preservative oil. Hey, and who even needs this connector? Oh, like, look at this. Do you think there can be a sensor that shouldn't be connected? Sure thing. For example, a neutral sensor. A what? So it's just an unconnected connector? There are no wires for it either? Well, it sure used to be better back in the days. They didn't do any extra connectors. But uh, look here. This connector doesn't look messed up. Yeah, it doesn't. Damn it. I don't even know where to start. Damn it. All right, let's have a look at this connector. Here's a two-pin connector, which is not connected at all. Let's try to connect it. It's just not connected. Just not connected. Damn it, Oleg. Oleg. Incorrect gear ratio. That's the fault, right? And the speed sensor is not connected. Uh -huh. Is there any chance that this connector was connected to the wrong thing? Like, maybe to the output sensor or to something else? I don't know, actually. It really looks like the sensor was just... Nothing was swapped here. It used to work, but then it stopped. It died, but... But wait a sec. Don't forget that the owner said first the speed sensor died, then the speedometer stopped working, they changed it... Uh -huh. and or maybe they didn't change it. Maybe they didn't. Well, we just have to find what we should connect here. I wonder if they sealed the connector by chance. <laughs> so, the connector is connected. Oleg, what are you doing? You've already, take, yeah. you've already taken these wires out? <laughs> Hold on a sec, what's this? Well, I'm intrigued by a two-pin connector that should be connected to the sensor. There, there it is. Have you found the connector? No, I found another sensor right uh, here. At least it looks like it. So here's one sensor, it can be input shaft, and this can be output one. The same kind of sensor? You see it, don't you? It definitely bent, but connected anyway. Ole. Shall we look at the schematic and figure out the color of the wires that are actually going there? This shit is here for a reason. Wait! Wait! Look over here! Look over here, please! I insist. What, did you find it? No, no, no. But I've found something else. Do tell me. Is it okay for a wire 
to lay on a receiving pipe that leads to the start. Balatska, look here. It's just here. Until it gets heated, it's okay. It goes around the muffler. Just laying on top. I have a question. What if this sensor should be connected here, but another one should be instead of it? Because, look, it's input shaft. And this is output one. That's the output? You're saying we should go out and have a rest? Wait, wait, come back, please. Transmission input speed sensor. Gray, red, blue and white. Yep, that's it. They plugged in the input connector to the output one, and they didn't plug in the output connector at all. Yeah, it's here. That's why it's so bent, what you're saying, the wire. Right, it's so tight there. Okay, I unplugged it. Here it is. Look, it's perfect. So, they didn't connect input and output shafts. So I'm reconnecting. It's definitely input, because Oleg checked the colors of the wires, and the wires of these colors lead to the input shaft sensor. But it was connected to the very end of the gearbox, where the output shaft is. There can't be an input one, because it'd be impossible to reach. It ends earlier. This connector fits perfectly, and the length is perfect as well. Just perfect. No bends, no nothing. So, why is everything so sharp here? I keep bumping my head. Everything's so sharp that my brain's about to leave. So, all in all, we have vehicle speed signal, which means that we have one speed sensor, which leads to some magical unit, showing two signals of two wires and PCM, and PCM unit thinks that one of them is car speed, and another is output shaft speed. But actually, it's the same thing, because they're coming from the same physical sensor. Then the question is, do we even need to connect the output sensor? I mean, what's, what's even connected to it? So if right now, we go and connect the input one, we start the car, lift it, and start moving. That'll be That'll it, and that sensor at the back was just extra, and we don't need to use it. And not connect it. I guess so. Let's try it out. So, there is that speed sensor, which is... We don't have time for that, Oleg. All right, let's lift it up. So, we just switched one connector, and now the test. I'm gonna start the car and test it out. And everything should work and switch properly. And if so, I'm gonna lose my damn mind. Okay, Oleg, place your bets. Will we have the result just by switching the connector? I'd say 2%. So you think that it's that likely? Well, it's so according to the scheme, but according to the logic, it's hella weird. Ah, scary. So scary, it's also shaking. Also because the indicator on the dashboard doesn't work, I don't know what gear I'm switching to. Okay, let's go. Here's drive. It has loaded. Let's try. Nope, nothing at all. It doesn't switch at all? It doesn't. You know, when you start it and press the pedal, first it starts vibrating a lot, and the faster you go, the less vibration there is. Mm -hmm. And now, when I reach 60 kilometers an hour in overdrive, the vibration almost disappeared. It's perfect. It's like it balances itself. But the question is, has it become better or worse? Well, you know, when you're not on the road, you don't have that moment when it's lurching. And I don't know if it's still going to do it, because the wheels are hanging in the air and there's nothing to lurch on. The owner said that it didn't switch gears properly even before, and in order to do so, you had to release the gas pedal and press it again. And because the gearbox is half manual, maybe in order to switch it, it was necessary for the car to roll. And here when you release the gas pedal, the wheels stop moving almost right away. So there's little inertia and load on the wheels so the gearbox doesn't switch. Now, first of all, we should connect back the connector to... To the gearbox. Why didn't the gearbox switch? Oh, for God's sake. It's because we... We're having great theories today, really great theories, about why we're not shifting. I agree. It's such a facepalm. When I was lowering the car, I thought to myself, don't forget to lift it up and connect the connector. I wonder why the gearbox doesn't switch. You tell me, Balotska. I think we should check the oil level. It all leaks out through the connector. 
I see you're trolling here. That's great. I hope, I hope we're gonna have enough electrical tape here for one drive, and it won't get destroyed by the drive shaft in the next few minutes. Should we first try when it's lifted up? No, Oleg, we're going for a ride right away. All right, time to drive this Chevrolet Blazer. So you see, this one's called a Chevrolet Blazer. Mm -hmm. But then it's also called the Chevrolet Tahoe. Like Ford has, for example, the Ford Explorer, one of the most widespread models. And there's also a van called the Econoline. But on some markets, the latter's called the Ford Explorer. So when you're Googling Ford Explorer, you might find a crossover or a whole bus. Here's the same. Here's the Blazer. It's a Blazer, but they started calling it a Tahoe. And now Blazer means those monsters which we even used to manufacture in Russia in the 90s. I think we had trail Blazer. No, that's another model. Totally different. But I'm talking about the Blazer with sad eyes which looks like this. That's a Chevy Blazer for you. And then it transformed into Chevy Neva, right? No, the production got shut down, thank God. Now the fastest test after revival, just switch one connector. Let's get inside, go for a ride, and see for ourselves. Open the gates. Oleg, will you watch as I drive out? In order to help you not bomb anywhere, or just admire the way you do it? That's a good question. Let's go. Speaking about speed, it does drive slower. But it's uh, low, isn't it? Yeah, but that's not the thing. We tried that last time, too. And now it's way slower, uh, Oleg. It used to be in emergency mode, and that's why it used second or third gear. But now I switched to low drive, and it's moving slow, which means that it was able to switch to the first gear, do you see? I agree completely to all the fun you're having here. Let it switch to the second one, and that'll be perfect. Okay, let's go. We're the owners of this amazing car, and we're just driving. Oh, there it is. That's it. The second gear. Moving on. But nothing happens. But we're already doing 80. Let's turn back. It's the first one. And now the second. And second is, and here's the third. It just switched. Yeah, I released the gas pedal just like he said. Now back to the second, releasing the gas. There's the third. It switched. Is it the third one? We're it is. Going. We're past 80. Now I'll we'll have the fourth. I'm going to let off the gas. Nothing. Nothing. Oh, nope, that was the fourth one. I hit the brakes and it switched back to the third. That's it. But what is it touching? It even stops the car! I didn't touch the brakes. I'm turning the steering wheel, and it stops. I think it's the wheel. That hard? What, does it touch the mud guards? Oh, the power steering's dead. Now, look what it's touching. I don't know how critical it is, but it is touching it. It really stinks like transmission. And the power steering stopped working. Yep, it's dead. I don't want to drive it anymore. Let's give it back. Come on, Oleg, get inside. Let's get moving. I'm sorry, Oleg, but you can't drive. I don't think that I'll regret it. The steering's making these awful sounds. It's touching something so bad. All right, we're coming back. Look, all the gears are working. <laughs> It's so absurd. It was just a connector. One damn connector connected to the wrong place. And there, now it switches gears real easy. And now, look, second. I won't say no problem, it still have some kicks. Oh, look, this gearbox is older than you. I'm sure it is.
Thank you, everyone. The reviving is over. <laughs> it's officially the fastest reviving we've ever had. That's what I suggest doing. You may ask me, Oleg, if a car is revived, why the hell did we bring it inside? So we could lift it up and refine the wiring, because otherwise it's embarrassing. That's right. And because we're about to finish up, we'll call the owner, and while he's coming here, we'll have enough time to lift the car up and at least put the wires in the places they belong with some clamps so they won't be damaged by the drive shaft and he'll be able to drive away. And I'll also tell him to grab some smaller wheels. And power steering fluid. And so, the only thing left is to refine the wiring somehow so we can take the original GM clamps. <laughs> and now, and we're going to take all the wires that seem a little dubious and clip them. Just in case. What are you going to set on fire? I want to sear the electrical tape a bit. For what? So it'll stick in place. What a lovely electrical tape. It's a special heat shrinkable duct tape. You've never done this before? If you don't do it, after some time, the electrical tape will peel off. And it prevents it from peeling off? It does, as if I'm soldering it. It's like you never worked with electrics before. Or haven't watched our videos. We get it, Oleg. But in all seriousness, it's a really great hack. Are you aware of your injuries? Here. I got that before, don't you remember? Oh, now I see, I got some more. When me and my wife moved in together, I was coming home and she used to have all the necessary stuff ready. Iodine, hydrogen peroxide, bandages and so on. So I could treat all the injuries. But now, a year after, she's not doing it anymore. <laughs> Mine just checks as to whether or not I have any limbs missing. They treat us like children. The first child is treated with a great care. Everything is sterile and so on. But if the third child took some cat food, then it's the cat's problem. By the way, I already got a parcel from your dad. With honey? Yep. I ordered five liters. <laughs> yeah, a boy. Right decision. I ordered lime flower honey, and it's just amazing. What feedback? Bolotska, get it on camera. Why are you shooting me? We also need to mention, if you don't know where to order it, here's the link in the description. It's always there. There's always the link. AP mute. I've unlocked some new knowledge that 5 liters of honey is about 8.5 kilos. Yeah, it's heavier than water. That's why I look so... I'm so healthy, never get sick, and I'm immortal in general, because I eat honey every day. Okay, Nikolai. The revival is over. It was super fast, so that we're clear. We started at 5 p.m., more or less, and finished at 5.30. The revival. And then we were busy trying to refine everything we discovered there. Do you know what the problem was? I'm dying to know. They just didn't connect one of the gear connectors correctly. That was it. In the gearbox itself? Yep. So we just pulled it out of the wrong spot and plugged it into the right one. So it was gear server's fault when they were assembling it back? No, with the assembly... They don't connect it during assembly. The gearbox was installed. It has some connectors. Actually, there are only two, the main one and the small one for the input shaft, and they connected it to the output shaft. That's it. So when it broke down the first time, it was due to some other reason? Yep, that's it. It just broke down. Maybe it broke down during the overhaul, so they fixed previous problem, but the new one appeared. Yep. As for why it broke down before, we can never know. But now, the reason is just a bad connection. Just one two-pin connection. 
We just connected it to the right place and that's it. Also, we found out that after putting the gearbox together, they attached the wiring to the main connector where there are all the solenoids and it was just laying on top of the drive shaft, like this. I guess a huge thanks to those who didn't assemble the gearbox correctly, or more accurately, the ones who connected the gearbox incorrectly, because if they'd done it, because in all likelihood, after driving for two or three days, the drive shaft would have destroyed the wires, and there would have been a short, and maybe something would have burnt. And where can you find one like that? Nowhere. I tried, I looked all over, and you can't find one for this car. So, it's better this way. It's better. Now we've refined the wiring and they don't touch the drive shaft. That's the first thing. Second is the starter wire. It used to be placed just on top of the muffler. Thank God you didn't warm the car up for a long time, otherwise the muffler would heat up, melt the wire, and it would short the thing. After ruining the gearbox due to the damaged wires, your starter wire would also be damaged. And next time you were turning the starter on without the fuse, you'd be on fire. Seems like the car is chasing this goal. It sure is. I think it was prepared for the second fire. But unfortunately, we've prevented it. Yeah. Now we've got your starter wire all safe. The gearbox wires are also safe. But everything else is in danger. Yep. The gearbox after the overhaul is totally screwed. It's covered in oil. It's leaking from the connector and from the side, but it sure is sealed so nobody can get inside it. So now you're gonna drive while you got a warranty and add oil because it's pouring out. But you can't take it off, change the pad or use sealant yourself because it's sealed. I came to the servers for the second time, but maybe it's just left from the second time they were trying to fix it, or it's definitely fresh, or they just didn't wash it off. But there are drops! And it's leaking through the connector pretty bad, so all the wires are screwed up. The rear gear unit is covered with oil. Did you come here on foot? No? Get this out of here. We don't need it. I gotcha. Thank you very much for agreeing to work with it. It's all Oleg. <laughs> when you first came to revive it back then outside, I was afraid there would be some stupid problem, and I was right. <laughs> well, actually, vice versa. <laughs> when nothing worked out first day, I had some confusing thoughts. From one side, it's all kinda bad, but if you'd come and had fixed it within 15 minutes, I think it would have been even worse. We've never done 15 minutes, but when we were doing the golf, it took us like two or three hours. Well, Oleg, just as I said, another baby bird leaving the nest. Well, actually, we didn't spend 18 days trying to revive this car, so we didn't have time to fall in love with it. Mm -hmm. But the relief is huge. It's such a relief that it didn't take us forever. But the sound will haunt me forever. Look how he's not turning the steering wheel fully. He knows how to drive this car. Bye-bye. And never come back! You say it to every car living in this place. Well, not every car. For example, I'd love to see the Bentley again. I didn't tell her not to come back, but even though it had been 17 days. But come on, it's the Bentley you led. Cut it out with this slander in my direction. At the very end of this video, I'd like to explain something. So maybe after watching it, you thought that the people repairing the gearbox are total idiots, switching the sensors incorrectly. But that's not the thing. The gearbox has two sensors. One is input, the other is output. That's how it selects the gear and whether or not there's friction slippage. But this car probably had its transfer gearbox changed. So this transfer gearbox also has the same sensor. So after putting it all together, there are three sensors sensors with the same connectors. And while assembling the gearbox, they connected the output of the gearbox and the output of the transfer gearbox, where the gears don't change. There's only one gear there. Well, they change only if you switch to low and overdrive. For this exact car, the third sensor is not used, but it's still there. So the people assembling the gearbox just didn't connect the sensors correctly. We just took off both connectors, plugged them into both sensors on the gearbox, and everything worked out. So there was no problem with the car exactly, just two incorrectly connected sensors. That's it. 
This is the revival we had this time. I hope you liked it. I personally was very interested in working with such an old American, I wanted to say SUV, but it's more of a truck. And that's it, more or less. Bye. It was a great revival. And here's why I say why we don't need this car, because it turned out that the particular front connector that we found unplugged was the connector for the front axle. And it's really weird. It uses an electromagnetic coupling, but that's not the weirdest part. The weirdest part is that this car doesn't have an inter-axle differential. So originally, it could be a rear-wheel drive car, and the front-wheel drive can be used only up to some particular speed and harsh conditions. So this Chevrolet Blazer is not a true SUV. It's a rear-wheel drive truck with the opportunity to sometimes, while driving in mud, turn on front-wheel drive. So, so I really don't know how we can call this car an SUV. It's not. It's a truck. Now, let's go. By the way, you want to know a mini life hack? More of a fact, really. All manufacturers, every single one, have agreed that the ideal cylinder volume is 500 cubic centimeters. That's why all the modern engines are either 2 liter and 4 cylinder or 3 liter and 6 cylinder. It's like a standard already. <laughs> they sure discovered something new. Back in my childhood, Uncle Vasa, somewhere in the garage, used to say that 1.5 liters is the perfect volume. I don't think he was talking about cars, Oleg. I don't know, but he sure used to make the sounds just like this Chevrolet. Especially after that liter and a half. You know, those Uncle Vosses in the garage always know ahead of time. But that's a totally different story. By the way, Oleg, let's go. I'll tell you something interesting. So, you just have to... Та-дам! Внезапное включение из будущего. Вы не знали, точнее, некоторые из вас не знали, но уже на нашем новом канале, который называется АП Команда, вышел видос Олега, где Олег является главным ведущим, и он дорабатывает свой дискач, и где я вообще не участвую. И, естественно, ссылочка на этот видос будет у нас в описании. Ё-мо! О май ё! Я же не убился! Ты очень эпично ушел с этого канала. Да. Чуть не... Вот, короче, переходите и смотрите, это очень классный видос и ссылка в описании. Да.